Welcome to Summit Community Church. We are so glad you're with us. We want to connect with you during the service, so feel free to post comments in the live chat section. If you're watching us for the first time, our Summit family would love to get to know you. Tell us where you're tuning in from, as well you can head over to the Summit website and click on New Here to find our connection card. One of our team members would love to connect with you. At Summit, we have all kinds of different opportunities to grow together, stay connected, and serve in our community. For full details on all that's going on at Summit, check out our website, summitcommunity.ca. So go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you can get all the latest updates here on YouTube and don't forget to like this video. Let's worship together this morning. Take it away, worship team.
Well, friends, I want to invite you to pray with me, but just before I do, I wanted to highlight for each one of us to uh, be aware of what is coming in January. January is our month of prayer and fasting. And here at Summit, we have built a rhythm into our church of starting our new year with an intense focus on praying together as a church and fasting as well. There's a power that gets released through the people of God as they sincerely fast and pray, where they uh, abstain from eating food for a time while they spend time in prayer during the duration of their fast. Some of those fasts uh, are different in length of time. For some people, it could be uh, fasting for a meal or for a day. Uh, other people will want to extend that time. The vision is that every single day in January, there would be someone or some people from Summit that are fasting and praying for the ministry, the mission, the people of our church. Uh, some of you will want to do extended fasts. I know I do that and I invite others to do the same as we seek God as we uh, pray fervently for the ministry, the health, the uh, outreach and mission of our church and for our people. And uh, the elders and the staff are in process right now beginning to think about uh, what the Holy Spirit will lay upon our hearts to make as our prayer goals for this year in our month of prayer and fasting. I wanna encourage you to take out your calendar, your iPhones, or whatever you happen to use, and that you would mark it on your calendar, month of prayer and fasting, and that you would seek God and ask Him, how should I fast, for how long? To make times of prayer more intentional through this month. And let's believe God together that He will do wonderful things in us and through us. You know, the early church, after Jesus was resurrected and he ascended into the heavens, Jesus released his Holy Spirit upon the church. And one of the main descriptions of the church says this, that they were devoted to prayer. The power of the early church to turn their very secular and turbulent world upside down for the cause of Jesus Christ came as a result of being devoted to, committed to, um, passionate about praying, and they engaged deeply in prayer. The early church prayed for everything. They prayed for the proclamation of the word. They prayed for the health of their body, the church. They prayed for problems that arose. They prayed for the resources of God to come upon them. They prayed and believed that God's activity would be unleashed in our affairs through the avenue of prayer. At Summit, it's one of the deepest values that we have, that we saturate our ministry and mission in prayer, to become a praying church, not just a church that occasionally prays. So friends, I invite you to join me, to join our staff, to join our elders in focusing on prayer and by engaging deeply in prayer for the month of January and fasting as you are able and as the Spirit leads you to do so. We are going to have our first uh, prayer summit on that evening, uh, Wednesday, January the 5th, where we will gather together as a church. Uh, we may be online, it might be hybrid, but we are going to gather together and we are going to pray. And it's an exciting time where we get to pray in different ways and in different groupings. And it's just a wonderful time for the body to gather to pray. Would you join me? Would you gather and put it on your calendar January 5th, Wednesday evening? And we're going to end our month of prayer and fasting two days later, February the 2nd, with our second prayer summit of the year. And we want to see at least 10 of these occur this coming year in 2022. There are so many things to be praying about. Our world's in turmoil. There's tensions everywhere abounding. And the cause of Christ is running up against all kinds of oppositions uh, from the enemy. But in prayer, we can see that the gates of hell themselves 
will not stand against Jesus building his church if the church does so using his methods. And that what leads the way in that is prayer. So I look forward to praying with you January the 5th as we kick off our month of prayer and fasting. Now, I, it's my privilege to lead us in prayer today. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me. Father, it's a mystery in some ways of how you work sovereignly. You could do anything you want. You don't need us. But yet, you have chosen in your sovereignty to respond to the prayers of people. And so we as a church come, and as a statement of our faith to you, as a statement of our our reliance upon you, we will gather to pray for that month of prayer and fasting. And Lord, we're doing so by faith that you're going to break strongholds, that you are going to release power, that you are going to give freedom, that you are going to move in and through us. So Lord, we even at the very outset, before we get near that month of prayer and fasting, we ask for your blessing. And we, we come expectantly what you're going to do in us and what you will do through our prayers. So God, would you create Summit to be a praying church more deeply than it is? And I ask you to do that. Father, as we pray to you now, we come to you and we, we know that there are people in our church that are just so stressed. They're frustrated with COVID. They're pressured with their young children at home and school and work. Lord, we are tired of being boxed in, it feels like. There are so many things in our hearts and our lives that are, it just, we just feel the pressure. And I'm asking you, Lord, that would you come and bring your peace? Would you encourage your church today? We pray especially for those as we come across this Christmas season who have lost loved ones this year and even this past week. We pray for Denise and Adrian Smith and God in the, just trying to get over a loss of a sister not too long ago, yet here a niece. And I pray for Denise that you would bring your comfort upon her. For parents, who've lost kids, for kids who've lost parents, for spouses who've lost a partner. Oh, Father, we pray at this Christmas season, may your comforting presence undergird and strengthen those who are grieving during this time. We pray, Father, that you would bless our gatherings as we worship together as a church. Would you bless the gatherings of families during this Christmas season as they get together to celebrate and to be together? I pray that you would give them wisdom as to how they do that. But I pray especially, Lord, if there are relationships that are just out of sync or that are in tension, would you grant a spirit of humility to fall upon every person in our church? Would you bring a spirit of reconciliation that would bring healing to relationships and families? Father, we thank you for your provision through all of the journey of COVID. And we want to say thank you for all that has been given to the church and that which will be given as we move forward to the next few weeks. We thank you, Lord. We don't take it for granted. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would bless every gift that's given. Would you multiply it and translate it into lives and blessing and good in our world? And would you be faithful to your word to supply the needs of those who in faith have given to you? God, we are so thankful for just the capacity to be able to worship you in this country. But Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our church, that every person who calls Summit their home, Lord, would you strengthen their faith, develop their character. I pray that you would bless them, Lord, with all that you have for them, that you would 
anoint their ministry to other people. And I pray, Lord, you'd give us perseverance through coming pressures against the church in our culture. May we stand united, strong. I pray as we link arms with other churches in our region that proclaim Christ and are faithful to your word, Lord. Would you bless these churches? Thank you for teammates that are so faithful to you for the cause of Christ. And Lord, we pray. I want to pray so, uh, for Garrett over at Bethel, uh, Christian Reformed on Bayview. Thank you for this brother. Thank you for his love for you, for their new baby. Thank you for their church. And I pray that you would anoint him and his team and bless that church, Lord. Thank you for such a strong teammate in the kingdom here in this region. And we want to thank you, Lord, for our missional partners, and we want to focus on our friends in uh, Hoka and Alex in uh, Peru at Inca Link. We thank you for the fact that they could be with us a few weeks ago, and we ask, Holy Spirit, fill them, anoint them, bless them as they've gone back and as they are serving you. Oh, Jesus, use them to spread the love of Christ and the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God to those who are in need. Father, it's our joy to sit under your word today. And so we pray for Pastor Lloyd. We ask that you would anoint him, that you would speak through him to us. Take your word and would you encourage us? We joyfully sit under your word to receive what you have through him. And we pray your anointing on him as he comes now to speak. Lord, we love you. And we are so appreciative of your presence with us. Receive our praise and our thanks. And I thank you for your church called Summit. Bless this church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. Advent means coming or arrival. The first week, we lit the first candle. The first candle represents hope, hope of the Messiah's coming. As well, last week we lit the second Bethlehem candle, which represents the love, love that Jesus has for each of us. Today we light the shepherd's candle. This candle represents joy. It reminds us how the shepherds felt after they visited Jesus the Messiah in the stable shortly after he was born. Listen to what it says in Luke 2.20. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. As we light this candle, we can celebrate the joy we find in Jesus. Good morning, brothers and sisters, Summit family. It's such a blessing and a privilege to see you today and just an honor to share God's word with you today as well. And during this Advent season, we're leading up to Christmas, and we are working on the series and walking through the series, Our Gift, Jesus. And we have been learning about Jesus as our hope, and also Jesus, our love. And today what we will do is explore how Jesus is our joy. And when I think about Christmas, there's a few things that I really touch my heart and one of which is Christmas songs. When you're walking through the mall and there's this festive spirit and there's this atmosphere of wonder and amazement in anticipation of this time of year in the Christmas season. But for me, there's also these timeless hymns that really take me back to these childhood memories that I remember during Christmas time of family and, and fun and laughter and also waking up early to unwrap the Christmas presents under the tree. And of course, there's those Christmas specials that are on TV and just watching those cartoons on early on in the mornings. So this season also reminds me of the hopes and dreams that remain unfulfilled. But also there are the, the loved ones who passed away who are with the Lord to this day that I remember this, this time of year. So this Christmas season, I think not only of the miracle of Christmas, but I also think about our family and friends that, who, who do not know the joy of the Lord. 
the spirit of Christmas can be lost in the commercialization or the busyness of this season, hustling and bustling back and forth. So let's take this moment just to just be still and bring, bring this message to the Lord with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the blessings of a new day. We thank you, God, that you encourage our hearts and inspire us through the word of Christ. And we thank you, especially at this time of year, that you teach us of the true meaning of Christmas and the mercy and the grace and the truth that you revealed to us through Christ, your Son. And Father, thank you for the guidance and the leading of your Holy Spirit and that you're the one who's walking beside us, you're the one who watches over us, and you're the one who encourages our, encourages our hearts to keep running this race each and every day. So Father, no matter how many times we have heard of the message of Christmas and all that you have in store for us at this time, we pray that you continue to bring forth your message anew and afresh today as you guide us by the power and the presence of your Spirit upon us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the past two weeks, we've been talking about love and we've been talking about hope as well that we have in the Lord. We learned about Jesus, our love, Jesus, our hope, and Jesus, our joy, and how God embodies all of these things through Christ himself. And one of the foundational passages that we will start off with today is from Isaiah 9, 6. And in this passage, it says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And note the emphasis where it says his shoulder and his name, because all these names are a representation of Christ himself in one way or another. And this prophecy really sets the stage for this message during this Christmas season as we reflect more deeply as to what God has to say to us today. This was written over seven, about 700 years B.C., before our Savior, Savior's birth into this sinful world. So we will we'll be looking through this through the eyes of our triune God and our response to Him to rejoice in the Lord today. And the first point I'd like to make is beginning with the fullness of joy that we find in the incarnation of Christ. From the nativity story, we discover that Christ is the representation of hope. He's the epitome of hope. But he is also the personification of love that is above and beyond what this world has ever seen. And in him, this, there's this manifestation of joy that is from everlasting to everlasting. He descended into the darkness of this fallen world, and he was sent forth here to redeem lost souls. In Luke 2, 10 to 11, it says, The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who, who is Christ the Lord. When the good news was sent to Mary by the shepherds, Mary treasured up these things and she pondered them deeply within her heart. And it's important that we too have this posture in our heart as we come to, to reflect upon who God is through Jesus Christ. We reflect upon his prophetic word and his precious promises that he has made to us in this passage. And as we reflect and meditate, we are drawn closer and closer to the very heart of Christ. And it's in meditation that we find this doorway to the very heart of God, the secret place of God, if you will. And we are really be called to him, not only to fear not, but to behold, to observe, to seek his face and look for him. So this is the very heart and the dwelling place of the Holy One that was sent from up above in the heavenlies. And in him, there's this inexpressible joy that we have in him these days, and even in the days to come. And in the joy of the Lord, there is never-ending joy, and this joy will never be lost. Is something that is eternal and everlasting and we can hold dear to our hearts now to the day that we see him face to face. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way in his book, Life in Christ. 
there is only one thing that can give us true joy, and that is the contemplation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to note that as Christians, we have a greater capacity for hope, a greater capacity for love, and a greater capacity for joy. And the truth is nothing in this world can ever offer us this degree of joy that only is in Christ himself. So think about the different situations that you face. Perhaps you have lost your job or there's a a broken or strained relationship that you're dealing with nowadays. Or maybe there's even a death of a loved one that you're grieving or mourning through during this time. Or maybe there's a diagnosis. Maybe there's a disorder or disability that you're struggling to deal with and being able to cope with these days. But have you ever wondered how we together as a body of Christ can rejoice in the Lord, have joy in the Lord and peace in the Lord in such circumstances, even in a pandemic, even in the crises that we can be calm and have quietness and great joy in our hearts. Charles Spurgeon, a pastor and an author, wrote, it, wrote this, this. He said, believers are not dependent upon circumstances. Their joy comes not from what they have, but from what they are. Not from where they are, but from whose they are. And not from what they enjoy, but from that which was suffered for them by their Lord. So there is this everlasting joy and enduring peace that is in Christ himself that he's come to to share with us, to share with us his very life. Christ the Lord has, in his sacrificial love, revealed himself to us in the depths of the love of the Father. In him there is freedom for our souls, and there is life eternal and new life forevermore as well. So in him we find victory over the entanglements of sin. And also there is strength to carry on these days, especially in light of all that's going on in the world. We have strength to keep keeping on. So in him we find the joy of our salvation, and we also find this new beginning or this new chapter in him because In him we are a new creation. In Matthew 9.10, it says, Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And here we find the star that rose up and went before them and rested upon the place that they were. So isn't this a beautiful picture of Christ's manifest presence in this story? We think about it as Jesus as the bright morning star, the one who rose up and rises up from within us, the day star that rises up from within our hearts. And Jesus is also this sovereign light that has gone before us, who's even prepared a place for us, and one day we will see that come to light. And Jesus is also this spirit of joy and peace that rests upon us so that we won't be shaken even in the midst of crises, even in a time of suffering and pain. We can rest upon him. So notice when the the star, when they saw the star in this story, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And there is really no greater sight than the, the light of life that is in Christ that is revealed to us. And he reveals himself to us in a realm that we see and do not see. And he speaks also in dreams and visions. And the joy of the Lord is a matter of divine perception, to be able to see as God sees into a realm that is unseen, an eternal realm that we can only see through the eyes of faith. And this is the faith of Christ himself that he has given to us by the grace of God. There is a man in our congregation that I'd like to share with you a brief story. And he was going through a cataract surgery. And this was in September, a few months ago. And after the surgery, he he lost his sight in his right eye. And he went through several procedures and he went through anguish and pain and suffering. But then... What happened is, together as one church, what we did is we prayed persistently and faithfully as we brought this petition to the Lord. 
And after 40 days when he was in this desolate place of, of darkness and just pain and suffering, the Lord restored his sight miraculously. So this, remember, this is not only about the physical sight that he can see, but also it's the grace of God that's restoring his spiritual sight as well. So this is the light of the gospel message that's being unveiled to him even as we speak. And by the grace of God, he is being, he's being transformed and God has touched his heart and just revealed to him a realm that he's never seen. So this is the true joy and the miracle of Christmas that God is a God who is gracious, a God who is merciful and kind, a God who sees us, a God who loves us, and a God who is with us each and every day. It's why we're here celebrating this Christmas season. So praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us victory in him. And we praise God in the highest. He is the one who's deserving of the highest praise, and we thank him for this miraculous testimony that he's given us. The second point I'd like to make is the invitation of the Father. There is the joy in the Lord Jesus Christ because of the invitation of the Father. In John 1.1, 1, 1, the passage says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. So his word, like we were talking about last week, is not only a love story, but it's a love letter that's addressed directly to us from God himself. Jesus is the word of the Father, and his word is written in our hearts and written in our minds as well. Jesus is the testimony of God with us, and he's the covenant of love from God for us as well. And our experience of, of joy is really living proof or evidence, if you will, of the one true and living God who lives inside us, with us. So is there not great joy knowing that God knows us to, the, to this degree? To know that God loves us so much that he would send an invitation to us and invite us into his very presence to love us unconditionally so? There is great gladness in our hearts. When we respond to this invitation and, and yield our hearts to him as well. And our souls rejoice because God delights in every little detail of our lives. And he knows our lives from beginning to end. And he loves us so much. And he cares for, for us in every way. So it's amazing that this invitation from God, it's not imposed upon us. He doesn't impose his will or his way or his word upon us, but rather it's a proposition from God, or, or a proposal, if you will. In Psalm 1611, it says, You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So in Christ, we have God's word to us, and God's word is a map and mirror in our day-to-day -day lives, in our walk with Him. So God has gone ahead of us, and He has not only revealed Himself to us, but He's revealed ourselves to us as well. Through His Word, it reveals to us the judgments of our hearts, the attitudes, and the disposition of our heart as well. Through His Word, we discover who we are, and even how we are like Him. And He reveals to us the, the inclination of our hearts, so in him, we find also this roadmap, this roadmap to righteousness, this roadmap to, to truth, this roadmap to peace. And there is great joy as we reflect upon this and walk upon this path. And ultimately, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we reflect the light of his wonderful face each and every day to the people of this world, to our friends and family, neighbors and strangers that we meet along the way. You know that moment when you see someone and you can just tell from a mile away that they've been spending time in the presence of the Lord. You know it when you see it because there's a, a glimpse of the glory of God, even the face of God, if I would go as far as to say that, in that person. They even seem like a different person because you see this kind of radiance of holiness and a look of contentment from them that is within them. And this is the joy of the Lord and the radiance of Christ that's shining through. 
So we are all predestined to grow in the likeness and the character of God. And that's a beautiful truth that with every step of obedience we take, that we are growing more and more like Him. And with every step that we take by faith, we are growing in the likeness of Christ as well. So through this whole process, we are becoming more and more like Him and less like us. The third point I'd like to, to make is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There is joy in the Lord because of the inspiration of the Spirit of Christ. In Galatians 5.22, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So remember, joy not only represents the fruitfulness of our lives, but it represent, represents the, the fruit of Christ in our life. So in the original Greek language, it's important to take note that the word fruit is used as a singular, singular verb. And this represents the harmony and the wholeness that is in the character of God. It represents also the oneness that's in the Trinity and even the oneness with us. So this is the character of God that is within us that establishes our every step. And when we develop this character, then the conduct will follow. It doesn't go the other way around. The character comes before the conduct. So this is a beautiful passage that, that says that really the Spirit of Christ springs forth in love and joy and peace and so forth. According to the words of Donald Gray Barnhouse, he puts it this way, Love is the key. Joy is love singing. Peace is love resting. Patience is love enduring. Kindness is love's truth. Goodness is love's character. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's forgetfulness. And self-control is love being the reins. Ultimately, love is the key to the door of God's very own heart. And he's welcomed us to receive more fully the, the joy of the Lord, the love of the Lord. And this joy that we have in him is really a response to rejoice in the grace of God. It's his welcoming. It's his invitation. And the peace that he gives us is really being able to rest in his presence and knowing that the Lord is near, that he's close to us and that he holds us close to his heart. And as we are continued to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there is this holy longing for his return. And during this time of Advent, which is really a representation of his coming and his arrival, there's this anticipation of the days to come and the day that he would return to take us back home. So we celebrate these days, not only Jesus' first coming, but also his second coming as well. And this, this joy-filled anticipation of those days. And we wait for his return that in the same manner that the, the shepherds and the wise men and also the angels waited for his arrival into this earth. And today we rejoice, not only because he's coming back, because, but it's also because he would take us back to our heavenly home, the place where we belong. So one day this bridegroom, which is Christ himself, will come back and be re reunited with his bride, which is the church of Christ. But what is your response to this divine invitation from the Lord? Because there is this great triumphant joy, this kind of uprising, if we would fully embrace the, the truth of the message and the me true meaning of Christmas. Like, even in the darkest depths, God can raise us up to the utmost heights. And there is not only joy in, in living a life for God, but this is the living joy that is within you, joy of Christ himself. And the spirit of the world, the spirit of the word is life eternal. And this joy is living and active within us. And there is this kind of fountainhead of joy that is in Christ that is ever flowing in and through us every moment of each and every day, sustaining us in every way. The fourth point I would like to make is 
the intention of the heart. So there is joy in the Lord because of the intention of our hearts. The passage from 1 Peter 1.8 says this, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So in this passage, notice the emphasis on you and your. So we have a part to, to play in our response to God. It says, you love him, you believe, you receive your faith and your souls. So your intention is very important. You deliberately make a choice to choose joy in your life, to choose light and not darkness, to choose the blessing and not the curse, to choose the path of righteousness and not the worldly way. So it is a decision that you make to draw near to God as he draws near to us and vice versa. But God is the one who initiates that whole process. And through it all, we find this kind of journey of faith as we discover who he is in us and and who we are in him as well. It's interesting that in the Chinese language, there is a phrase uh, for happiness, which is written as two characters. So the first word is open and the second word is heart. So ask yourself this question, especially these days, is your heart really open to the Lord? And if so, to what and to whom is it open to? Or is your heart calloused or or is it closed because of denial or or guilt of, of shame? Or is your heart really hardened because of trauma or abuse or a difficult upbringing that really is a burden upon you even to this very day? Or maybe it's darkened because of unforgiveness or stubbornness in your heart because of the pain of the past or somebody who's mistreated you and it's been so difficult for you to let go and walk in freedom. Maybe even it's a rebellious spirit that's causing division within you and with God and even in this church. Or perhaps all you really want is what God can give you, but you do not want God himself. Jane Wachowski put it this way. She's a singer, a songwriter who performed on America's Got Talent. And she's really still standing through a battle that she's going through, through three different um, bouts with cancer, cancer in the lungs and, and the spine and the liver. She says this in her blog, God is more of a giver than a taker. He doesn't take away my darkness. He adds light. He doesn't spare me of thirst. He he brings water. He doesn't cure my loneliness. He comes near. So why do we believe that when we are in pain, it must mean God is far? You see, in in this process of, we, we need to really realize that it's in dying to ourselves that we find true life and true joy in Him. It's in in losing ourselves that we are fully immersed in this joy of the Lord that is in Christ himself. And in the Bible, joy is very closely connected to grieving well and mourning losses. Don't get me wrong, this is not necessarily being mourning or grieving the death of a life or a loved one. But this is death of yourself, of your old self, of your old ways of thinking, of old habits. It really is this whole process of learning to let go of ourselves and yielding our hearts to God because He knows best for us. So giving up all of us for all of Him to fully receive the fullness of His love, the fullness of His joy, so that our joy in Him will be complete. I really love this passage from Proverbs 14.10. It says, The heart knows its own bitterness. And no stranger shares in its joy. You see, you can share your bitterness with anyone. But only someone who knows you can truly share in the depths of the joy that you have in the Lord. You can only share your joy in life with someone who actually knows you, who knows your story, who knows your burden or your bitterness or brokenness. 
And likewise, the joy of the Lord in you is really in proportion to your relationship with Him. And it reveals the depths of your relationship with Him or even lack thereof. So there is this river of joy that is reserved for you by Christ. And here you will find your portion from Him. And in you, I mean, in Him you'll find your lot in life secure because He is our all and all. So there is someone who's come to, to bear this burden with you. He knows the bitterness of your soul. He has come to drink this cup of bitterness or this cup of wrath for you. And he's come to share his joy for you and with you as well. So if you really want to share in the joy of the Lord, you must know him. You need to also know the brokenness of his heart for you and the grief of his heart because of our sins against him, the fallenness of this world, our rebellion, our wickedness, and our sin. So it's important to realize that the battle cries of our hearts are really in proportion to the depths of our love for him. There's this kind of struggle for joy and this wrestling for joy. But it is indeed a commandment to rejoice in Him always, to give thanks in every circumstance, because this is the will of God for us. Now, if you want to to know the, the heart of God, you need to know that God is familiar with pain. And He knows what you're going through, and He's endured the pain of this world. He sympathizes with all of your sufferings, and He knows all of your weaknesses. And you can trust in Him because even in those moments, His strength is made perfect in you and through you. And it's in this endurance of suffering, of hardship, of pain, that we find the passion of Christ revealed. The root word of the word passion is really suffering, the suffering servant, the passion of Christ. So it's in this kind of valley of life or through trouble or through heartache or whatever it may be that you're going through, it's through these troubling times that the, the, the heart of, for God is cultivated and we develop this greater capacity for joy, which is in God himself. So this joy is more than just a command. It's more than just a command to rejoice or just simply be happy in the Lord. It's not that, it's not that simple. It is also the inclination of our hearts, the disposition of our hearts, because we long for infinitely more than what this world can ever offer us. And it is really to to have a heart that's unwrapped here as it will be in heaven. There's this gift that is within us that God has given us that is in himself. And one day you will see that this is the greatest gift of all that is within you, that is within us together as a body of Christ. So what is it that you cherish most about your life? through pain and suffering, through heartache, through hurt? Is it not what He has so graciously given to you? Is it not Christ in you, the very gift of life and breath of life that is within you? This is the gift of life. This is the gift of God. And this is the gift of Christ Himself to reveal to us His love. And as we wrap up here, I'm going to walk through a passage that is from John 16, 21 to 22. It says here, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish. For joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. When all is said and done, the reality is that God will deliver you from this fallen world. It's not the way that it was meant to be in the first place. We together are children of God. We are born into this fallen world, yes, but our home is in heaven. There's kind of this homesickness that we have because we long for much more than this. We long for an eternal home a day when we will see Christ face to face. So we are all going through these birth pains or these growing pains, if you will. 
And together we endure together as a body of Christ. And there's immense pain and there's terrible things that are going on in this world, but yet God has overcome all the troubles of this world. And in Him we find hope, in Him we find love, and in Him we find joy that's everlasting and eternal. So all of creation groans in waiting for His return. But there is great joy in anticipation of His arrival, and one day we will see Him again. And through this process of discovering, if you will, we can really express these wordless groans. And, and through this processing of pain, we find this unspeakable joy. When we lament and we cry out to Him, we find this triumphant joy that rises up from within our hearts. We can bring our pain to Him. He can take it. There is no burden that's too heavy for Him to bear. And He will carry us to the end of days, now to the day that we see Him face to face. So there is redemption when we are reminded of His faithfulness to us throughout the ages. And we need these reminders of what God has done, not only in our personal lives, but also from our forefathers. And we need to remember the precious promises of God, that He has a covenant of love and a covenant of peace that He keeps to this very day. And His word will not return back to, his, to Him empty. So we fight these battles daily sometimes. But ultimately, the battles in, in this world belong to the Lord. It's His name that's at stake. And there is victory in God, and He's already won the war. He knows the outcome. So He has also won our hearts, and in Him we have found the joy of our salvation, the salvation of our souls. So there is another, no other Savior, and there is no other Redeemer this world has ever known. And nobody can come to our Father God besides through Christ Himself. He's the one true and living God. And in Him we find salvation, we find deliverance, and we find freedom from sin, from this world, and even from the devil himself and the spiritual forces of evil in the kingdom of darkness. So God is the one who sits enthroned over the heavens and the earth. Come hell or high tide, even if the enemy comes against us like a flood, God will raise up a standard against them and He will prevail. And justice and foundation, justice and righteousness are the foundations of His throne. Christ the Lord is the one who reigns and He's the ruler of all and He's the Lord of our lives. So this joy in Jesus is really a glimpse of His boundless grace and this glorious life that is in God that is within us. So really it is a foretaste in these last days of the days to come and when His kingdom comes. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you sent forth your Son the Son of Righteousness who's come to bring healing upon His wings. We thank You for Christ's bloodshed for all of our sins so that we would be restored and redeemed. And we thank You, God, that we can even be Your mouthpiece to the people of this world so that they would know Your heart. We thank You for the joy of the Lord that is our strength and the perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. And we thank You for the, the love of God that You have expressed to us through Christ, Your Son the one true and living God, the one who's interceded for us so that we would come back to you. We thank you, God, especially during this Christmas season that you have given us the greatest gift of all, the gift of your love, the gift of eternal hope, and the gift of great joy in the Lord. So Father, seal all this in our hearts and remind us of the grace and the truth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, church, it's such a blessing and a privilege and an honor to share the benediction with you today. May the love of the Father and the grace of our Lord and Savior and the sweet fellowship of our wonderful counselor continue to be with you both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you, church. We love you. Thanks for being with us today. Our service will be posted here on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on anything and don't forget to like this video. Feel free to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for all the latest updates. Have a great week, church. We love you.